the massive billion dollar food companies that have been setting the, the agenda about research have have managed to avoid any decent studies comparing junk foods against normal foods. And they've continued to fund all this work about low calorie products, low fat products, and kept these in the guidelines without ever talking about this other sort of element in the room. And they've had this vested interest in doing this. And that's why we're, we're deluded into make, having ridiculous TV programs about calorie counting and uh, the dangers of fats and, and, and this obsession on our labels, which most people don't understand anyway, which detract, again, from the quality. I've definitely never had anyone come in saying that someone thought that they were my dad. So I think that's probably a good place to start. Yes, genetics and uh, <laughs> yeah. So the the cab driver, and giving your address and getting closer, said, uh, "Oh, you Roman's dad, then uh, you know, come to see him." And uh, yeah, so uh, Roman's dad, I must, I'm his brother, maybe oh, yeah. you know, can't be looked that old. But um, it's funny in concept. You did have a face mask on. I had a face mask on. Yes, and, and you've got a fabulous tan at the moment. I do have a yes, a good. A good tan, and I've probably got some Asian genes as well. So my kids had uh, these uh, uh, Asian birthmarks that, that you know they, they get from from Genghis Khan or whatever it was. Well, we'll get to genetics. Uh, the main reason for getting together today is you've written a fabulous book, Spoon Fed: Why Almost Everything We've Been Told About Food Is Wrong. And I mean, you know, we could talk about this book for for days. Basically, there's so much in it. But I think that subtitle is quite interesting. Why almost everything we've been told about food is wrong. So what did you mean by that? Well, I had to slip the almost back in there uh, from my agent, the publisher, who uh, always like a, <laughs> an even punchier title, as you probably know. <laughs> I know full <so> well. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me a few weeks to get almost back in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so... It turned out that uh, the title came at the end of the book, really. So once I'd finished it and I got my 23 myths, uh, things about food we got wrong, that we came up with this title. Uh, but then, um, and it it did come across that so much we've been led to believe over the last few decades has really been manipulated by, uh, you know, poor science, industry, advertising, uh, and just general, you know, peer pressure. Um, and so I wanted to focus, highlight those things particularly. But at the same time, I didn't want to throw out and sound like a complete nutter that says, uh, you know, I'm the only one who knows the answers. Um, there's, you know, everyone in nutrition is, you know, is wrong. Of course not. But it is hopefully highlighting uh, the fact that most people agree that eating more plants and fruits and vegetables is a good thing um and that was that's that's core to most of the nutrition advice and that's what people do agree on but um m what people don't really understand is even professors of nutrition don't actually agree on things that they the public think they do agree on and what we're told is what we're spoon fed if you like and we did a uh uh, a, a survey of 13 professors of nutrition, really uh, academics who've been in the field 20 years in the US and UK, gave them 100 foods to rank, common foods. And uh, we looked at their correlations. And basically, you'd expect to see a really good correlation between these scores. Because, you know, these weren't wackos. These were establishment figures, uh, all be it with some with strong views. And 50% of the foods they agreed on, 50% no agreement at all. And of course, they agreed on things like olive oil and um, plants uh, eating fruits and veg. But all this huge area in the middle, like dairy, meat, um, lean meat versus fatty meat, uh, diet drinks, uh, you know, butter v. margarine, uh, no agreement really at all. And I think that's what I meant by the almost. Um, but I think people forget that there is some common sense out there, and I don't want 
to feel that I'm a total anarchist um, uh, because, you know, after all, I am an academic. So um, that's important to me to not feel that I'm just trying to blow the whole thing up. You know, there is some agreement, but there's massive disagreement. And yet all the guidelines, all the NHS websites, all the uh, stuff, you know, whether it's my food plate or um, whatever guidance, particularly in in countries like UK, US, Australia, all makes it out that we know the answers. And we're sticking to the status quo of whatever we've been told for the last 30 years because no one really wants to admit a mistake. Yeah. And I think that that is sort of trying to sum it up. And I did it in a way that I, I thought was bite-sized. People get into these ones, have conversations about it because I want people to talk about these things because I think that's really... That's the vital bit. We're not going to necessarily see change from the top down. I think what I'm hoping is there'll be enough people from bottom up to start affecting a change, to start demanding uh, that these things are taken notice of and we can stop stop the rot, stop passing on this misinformation to our kids. Yeah. I think you've done a great job of that, Tim. And I, I really agree with you about this bottom-up approach because... We're seeing that at the moment, aren't we? We're seeing that for all the, the the cons of what happened on social media. There are many pros as well, and many people are being empowered. They're being informed. They're experimenting themselves and going, actually, I didn't know about this way of eating, but it's actually working really well for me. And I want to delve into that a bit later on about the whole uh, movement of personalized nutrition, which I think you're very much at the forefront of. But I'm super interested. You, you mentioned you're an academic. So why is it that an academic like you cares so much about food? What happened? Did you leave medical school like that or did something happen along the way? Uh, definitely didn't leave medical school like that. Definitely didn't leave uh, junior doctors like that. Um, and, you know, for a large part of my career, you know, believed um, my consultant's advice that, um, you know, everyone who gets fat is just lying and uh you know they they're cheating on the biscuits and uh if we eat less you you get slim um so it's really only the last 10 years i think i've i've really got into nutrition seriously i've done many different things in my my career but they've all been based around the last 25 30 years about twins and so that has been a platform that i set up where you study identical versus non-identical twins you look at nature v nurture, and you've got this one model that you can then apply to any common problem or disease or uh, exposure. And so this is an amazing resource. It's the largest in the UK, one of the biggest in the world. You know, we've written 700 papers using these twins. And it's given me the, the freedom to actually not only look at 100 different diseases, but also different risk factors and start thinking about things in a much broader way than most people ever do. Um, totally multidisciplinary, really, because everyone else I'm surrounded by in academia is very focused on a very small area of research. They can't see the big picture. And none of my medical colleagues were interested in nutrition because it was seen as the poor cousin, um, very primitive very you know basic ways of filling in questionnaires with pencil and paper um it wasn't glamorous it didn't have sexy genes it really was very very dull and uh, nothing was happening in it and you couldn't get grants so nobody really wanted to do it then really it all, it all came out of this my twin work really because i slowly transitioned from being really excited that identical twins were so similar and you know picked up a glass uh, of beer with the same little finger sticking out or some weird traits like that that as humans we all pick up on to the fact that realizing well actually identical twins usually die of different diseases they um, get different cancers they uh, you know much more different in terms of health than people think although they look very similar they look um, you know and their expressions and whatever you, as humans we over uh, exaggerate that because that's what we pick up on the smile the, the witty comment the voice but actually the health stuff is really different so why would that be why do you get identical clones who end up so different so that's got me into 
this area called epigenetics, which is how you can switch your genes on and off. And for five years, I, I was looking at that, and there were some differences between twins in these signals that you can get from diet and you can get from the environment or pesticides or whatever it is. But it was pretty obvious that we didn't have the great tools to study it, and the effects were quite small. So I was looking for something else. And the other big thing that suddenly hit about uh, 10, 11 years ago was the gut microbiome. Even in identical twins, they, their microbes were really different. And so suddenly I had a, a reason to explore that. And once I really uh, went into the gut microbiome as this new organ that's really different, even in clones, and is shaped by our diet and our environment, suddenly that was a sort of aha moment that said, wow, if, if that's so important, then this is how we can really study nutrition. This is, everything starts to become explainable in a sort of modern era approach as opposed to a uh, hundred year old approach of calories, fats, and proteins. Um, because it's down to the chemical levels, down to the interaction level. And you can suddenly start to measure it all and quantify it in a way you couldn't do before. So it was, it was a combination of these, these insights about the gut microbiome, plus it was the technology that you could suddenly measure gut microbes with genetic sequencing, which I was well-versed in from my, my years in genetics. Um, and you could also measure other things in food, so much as the chemicals. Uh, you can break food down, not into the three groups that we all know and hate, uh, but um, into 26,000 different individual chemicals. And, and you can do that with this, this whole approach of uh, mass spectrophotometry, but it's basically just drilling down into the detail and in a way seeing food and nutrition and your gut health in a completely different light to what we were able to do 10 years ago. And suddenly that transformed it into this, you know, you know from going from a, a village fate type uh, way of uh, looking at cooking to this high molecular, um, big data, algorithms, uh, giant computing way of, of looking at things that we could suddenly crack the problem. Mm -hmm. And that really was that, that's what put it together for me. And that's also, that introduced this whole idea of this pers personalization, really came from the uniqueness of our gut microbes. No, I think there's two people on the planet that have exactly the same uh, gut microbiome. And, and yet, when we compare that to our DNA, um, you know, we are probably fourth cousins uh, genetically. Um, we share over 99% of our DNA with each other, but you and I are not going to share many of our microbes. Um, however much, uh, you know, we uh, spent bond, uh, bonding in camps together or whatever, we, we'd be very, still remain very unique which means our response to the environment, our response particularly to food, is always going to be unique. So that's what really excited me about this whole field, that we, all these things were coming together just at the right time. Uh, and I was in this unique position because of having this twin cohort to really work out, well, how much of this is nature, how much is nurture? You know, we can start to do these big scale studies with these amazing, you know, 12,000 volunteers that um, have been, you know, I've been working with for the last... Uh, 25 years. Yeah. It's incredible to hear the journey. How much has your personal health challenges in the past played into the direction your career has taken? Um, I think it's changed quite a lot. Uh, and, and for people who aren't familiar, perhaps you could sort of elaborate on, on what <laughs> happens. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, ar around 10 years ago, I was doing some uh, trekking up a mountain, doing some ski touring in Italy, uh, high altitude stuff, uh, 3,000 meters. And uh, the last day of the, the holiday, I wasn't feeling very well and got to the top of the mountain and then uh, got a, a really, I felt a bit dizzy and it was nearly falling down all the way down. And got to the bottom and started, I could see double. So I had double vision and that lasted for three months and was very stressful. At the same time, my blood pressure shot up um, from being completely normal to being hypertensive. And that was, it turned out that was a, a micro 
occlusion, like a mini stroke, but it was a wake up call to me to um, lose weight and then try and work out the best diet for myself. And that started my journey of really self experimentation and um, in depth investigation into the whole field because I didn't really have any great prejudices other than as a doctor where we were told that fat is bad for you and that you should have you know mainly starchy vegetables and you know the classic uh, and you should have margarine and not butter um, were you overweight at the time um uh, slightly I was about 84 kilos um and I managed to lose 10 kilos um, so I'm now, you know, 74, 75 kilos. Um, I didn't feel, you know, until I started thinking about it, I, the, my weight had been creeping up by about one kilo a year, uh, for the last 10 years. Um, you know, hospital canteen, uh, lunches and things and conferences and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, orange juice here and there. But, uh, so that, that really was a turning point for me. And I think most people have that that at some point in their lives, you know, you didn't worry about stretching until you had back pain at, you know, the age of 30. That was, you know, and I start, that was a trigger for me. So most people need to learn from their own experience. They need a slap in the face. It's very hard preventively to say, if you don't do that, you'll get X. Well, you know, it's, I needed a wake up call. Um, naturally a bit lazy, thought I can get away with it as most people do. Um, but it's interesting, Sim, if you look at the nutrition space within the medical profession which as you well know more and more of us are becoming passionate about this as a very much under taught area and underutilized area when we're you know looking at patients and trying to help them it's interesting how many of the doctors and other healthcare professionals as well who've gone down this route have had some kind of personal experience either to them or a family member where maybe they were diagnosed you know i know many doctors who were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes didn't really want to take the medication thought well hold on hold on a minute before before i go on lifelong medication is there something else i can do and with that self-experimentation they then become very vocal advocates for you know lifestyle as a way of providing medicine i think it does take a, sh a shake up of that kind uh particularly in doctors i think that's a, that's a good observation um you know as as a wake-up call and it's either that as you said you know, a family member who suddenly gets really bad advice is the other way it happens. Their parents suddenly get diabetes or something and they say, hang on a minute, what sort of crazy advice are they getting about, about that? Um, but, uh, and, I, and I was no different really, uh, except that I um, got the wake-up call and, you know, then started doing this experimentation to improve my gut microbes. That was the first five years was really all about that. And then the last three years have been all about uh, personalizing and realizing that um, everybody's different. Therefore, you know, even the advice I was perhaps giving before uh, won't suit everybody and that we have this unique response to food. And that I started wearing all these, these gadgets, these yeah. wearables, these uh, gl continuous glucose monitors and measuring everything I possibly could, you know, being one of the most investigated people probably on the planet for food because I was in this unique position. Um, and that moved me in a way f further down this road uh, for the last um, three years as I was uh, found out that I was uh, pre-diabetic and that, you know, certain foods were pushing me over the, over the limit quite regularly. And so, having just gone from being, you know, having a bit of hypertension and being overweight uh, and this cardiac risk, suddenly I said, well, I've also got a potential glucose problem here. So that was really another yeah. insight that only someone in my position testing all the stuff would have. So yes, it's incredible to have access to so much testing on yourself. I'm sure many people listening or watching will be, wow, I wish I had that on myself. And, and we'll come to that. You know, Tim, you have this double vision. You're obviously, you're trying to get down a ski slope. That is scary, I'm sure, and worrying. And then presumably you saw a doctor of some sort to try and sort of provide some perspective on what might be going on here. Were you offered conventional advice at that time? Did you try and lose weight and sort of get on top of your blood pressure and health using conventional methods that didn't work? Is that what also fed into this? 
uh, I had I went through the conventional medical things of scans and the cardiologist and the eye doctor, um, and nobody suggested diet uh, would be of any use except the uh, my a consultant in hypertension who said, of course, you should always now give up salt. Um, which uh, is is about the only the only, the only advice that um, they they tend to give. So it was very standard stuff, um, and these people were experts in their field at teaching hospitals, uh, but nobody nobody said go and experiment, uh, try and do some different things. Um, it just wasn't on on the card. Basically, you, you, you use drugs to control these things. Uh, you had special glasses to for your for the double vision, and yeah, and at the time nobody did the sort of checks to see if I had pre-diabetes, for example, because um, they didn't do those those challenges. So uh, that's why I I said, well, you know, I I can do a much better job myself um, just by some self experimentation. I think that really uh, spelled it out to me how little even experts in this field do know about. The, the general world of of nutrition and about how we should be encouraging um, patients really to uh, to think more themselves about what they can do and to bring out all the things they probably know themselves because uh, they're worried that their doctor will yeah. say no you can't do that and you've got to have the low fat margarine you mustn't deviate from this course you know but, but so now I've I've sort of gone the other way and I you know I want everyone to experiment with food and find yeah. out what works and not just accept that, you know, if, if I'd accepted what my colleagues have said, well, you know, I, I, I would never go to a restaurant uh, because that would give me too much salt uh, and I'd never have a, a, an interesting meal ever again because uh, life without salt is, is, is pretty horrendous. And, you know, it would only improve my, my blood pressure by one millimeter. Um, so that's, yeah. It was just putting everything into context, and that's in a way why I wanted to write this book to start putting some of these bits of advice into a context for an individual, rather than you know groups of people. The idea that there is this average person there who's going to benefit from all these things, when actually the truth is, you know, we're all so different, and um, yeah. we need to find our own way. I, I love that there is a line in your book where you say you're very unlikely to be average something to that effect. And it was very powerful because what I've seen time and time again is that different people respond to seemingly quite different diets. And this is why I sort of am very much diet agnostic in the sense that I support minimally processed food. I support eating, in inverted commas, real food as much as you can. But I personally don't like to put myself in, in a camp anymore or a belief system or, or a religion around food because the truth is I've got patients who follow a whole food, low carb diets. Some are doing excellently well. I've got some patients who are doing a whole food vegan diet superbly well. And so therefore it's like, well, I can't say that this is going to work for you or not. And I kind of feel as a healthcare professional that my job is yes, to give the best advice I can, but also to kind of try to stay open-minded, try to be agnostic in terms of which diet I subscribe to and go, well, actually, what would you like to do? What are your beliefs? Because I, I could have a particular opinion and then my patient might come in and go, look, I've got a moral problem or an ethical problem with eating animals. It's like, okay, well, if that is the case, I have to be able to give you advice in the concepts of your beliefs. So I think this whole idea of, you know, you, you also said that the science is now telling some of us what we already knew. I think that's really powerful because I think a lot of us kind of know that, oh, the diet that my mate's on, I, I kind of tried that. It didn't work well for me. But your research, I think, has given that a lot of scientific validity now, which I think is very helpful for people. Yeah, well, I think what you just said, what you just said about um, uh, giving your patients the choice it is very refreshing, but most people in the medical profession don't do that. And we're told there's one recipe, you know, it's not a menu. Um, and 
all the experts, and I, I've been told off for writing these things in newspapers. I got some sort of vitriolic uh, correspondence when I was uh, talking about the, the diabetic uh, diets and, um, you know, going on these liquid uh, milkshake diets to cure your diabetes, saying, well, listen, that's fine, but, you know, these uh, high carb, low fat approaches may not be right for everybody. And, you know, let's also do the same thing, but perhaps with uh, low carb, high fat, which seems to be successful. And, you know, people would attack you from both camps um, <laughs> saying, you know, no, 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 ours is the right way. Uh, you're wrong. And that's because there's this huge sort of cognitive dissonance that people just saying, well, I've been doing this for 10 years. This is my life. This is what I do. And the whole academic scenario keeps going around that. They get more grants to do that. They can't be seen to, you know, be talking like us uh, to say, well, clearly, uh, if you look at the world, you know, there's a huge range of different diets in healthy places. These blue zones, they don't all eat the same thing. They don't make yeah. sense at all, other than in this idea that, you know, you find the the food that suits you. With You know, there's a few certain rules like, yeah, not eat, oh, don't eat ready meals <laughs> and uh, junk food all the time. Um, I think we'd be hard pressed to find any camp around nutrition who would disagree with that. Is there anyone who would disagree with that? Actually, some would. Some would say it's all to do with calories, wouldn't they? And actually, it yes. doesn't matter where they come from. Well, people from the food industry and those that they pay, and they have a lot of influencers, uh, you know, who, who uh, go around saying this stuff, saying you shouldn't blame uh, companies that, you know, have extra chemicals in their food to make it taste good because it's important that it's low fat and it's low, low and it hasn't been proven to be harmful. So there is there are people that do still project that in the same way that people were promoting, you know, low low tar cigarettes. Um, you know, it's not very different. You say you haven't proven they're bad for you uh, because the, the studies haven't been done. Just because it's got chemicals in it, we shouldn't knock it. And in, in a way, it's the the same people knocking the um, uh, uh, pure food movement, the clean eating movement, sort of going the other way and say, well, let's not go overboard and it's fine to eat lots of lots of chemicals. Uh, so I think, but you won't find many um, academics saying that, that that's definitely true. But I think we do have to... Um, make this distinction and that's why i want to keep coming back to it this this almost almost everything you know vast number of people do agree that eating plants uh is good and avoiding large amounts of regular ultra processed food is bad mm -hmm. and outside that i think uh you know there is quite a lot of room for individuality and finding what works not only in what you eat but also how you eat and i think that's that's the other thing that's been coming out of our studies is, um, you know, it's not just what you've got on your plate. It's, you know, whether you break it into, into portions, what time of day, what you did the day before, how much sleep you got, you know, it's incredibly complex, this, this, whole, this whole idea. And once you throw all those balls up in the air, uh, it, it's really interesting to see how, you know, the perfect way they could fall for some people and uh, how others would do really badly um, yeah. through that mix if they get it wrong just because of dogma, just because that's the way everyone does it around here. That's the time everyone has their tea around here. That's the, you know, you've got to have your breakfast because, uh, uh, you know, that's the way everyone's done it for the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, I just want, you know, people to question all this stuff and start saying well, what works for you yeah. because a lot of this this dogma about we must do it this way, we must have, you know, it's like snacking, you know, why uh, why do we suddenly start snacking about uh, 30 years ago? And yeah. this idea of a healthy snack and, oh, it's high protein, low fat, healthy snack, free from gluten. You know, I mean, did we need it? Were we really going to faint um, if we didn't? No. And, you know, you really look around the world and see how, and, and I think we don't do that nearly enough. Is, is make these comparisons with other countries that are much healthier than our own to say, you know what, it isn't normal to have six meal events in a day around the world. Um, doesn't suit 
Uh, most people. I, I read this article in The Guardian a, a few years back. Um, I think, you know, there was some book out about the French. And I think it was something of to do with why French kids don't misbehave or something, something like that. You know, there's a, there's a punchy uh, kind of probably misleading headline. Why French <laughs> French wives are always skinny or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so exactly. And, and, and actually what was really interesting is that the one thing I do remember from the article was I think they were just saying that actually in, in France as a, as a culture, there's not much snacking or certainly French kids Actually, you eat what you eat at mealtimes because after that mealtime, when it's when the doors close on mealtime, you ain't getting anything else until the next mealtime. And I think actually the French are there's something we can learn from the French. I think here in in Britain, but in terms of foods, you just mentioned, uh, and I very much agree with this that it's not only what you eat, it's how you eat. It's also when you eat, right? All these things play a role, which I think your research is is really helping to showcase. Um, but why, you know, the French, for example, you know, they don't do a rushed meal typically like we do. We, they won't have their, you know, let's say they've still got their healthy lunch. Let's say they're probably not going to be having that in front of their computer whilst answering their emails. And I know that to be the case that it's still, cause I, I had an interview with a French journalist about 18 months ago and I asked her, I said, Hey, look, you know, we hear this about the French. Can you just tell me, is this still part of French culture? She said, yeah, absolutely. The only place where this appears to be different now is in Parisian offices of international firms. This was pre-pandemic uh, when he says that the sort of international culture of having food at your desk seems to be infiltrating. And I found that's interesting. So in terms of your research on personalized nutrition, I wonder what are some of these non what's on your meal uh, components what 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 what, have, what has your research shown up is there any sort of insights you've got for us well our basic plan which we've been doing for the last three years is to give thousands of people um, identical meals and see their responses to them and then start giving those meals at different times and see how that affects them and um we haven't yet got into the details of snacking or not, other than that we know that if you snack, you will, uh, a couple of hours before a meal, your metabolic response to that meal is poorer than if you didn't snack. Okay, just say that again, because I think that's really important. If you do snack before your meal, your metabolic response is poorer at the next meal. Yes. Oh, and yes. Just for people who are listening who don't understand that, what do you mean by metabolic response? So what we're measuring is these uh, peaks in your, in your blood um, uh, in, in three ways. One is your blood sugar level, which normally goes up about 30 minutes after you've eaten. And that is your blood sugar and your insulin level um, get a little surge, and that's normal after you eat. Uh, and we also measure your lipid levels, so triglycerides, are one of the commonest fats in, in blood, and they go up after a meal. And they we look at those six hours after a meal. And at the same time, you can measure something called inflammation, which is like the irritation in the, in the blood, uh, and you can measure those levels. So th those three markers, we think that people who have food that gives them regular spikes of these things, uh, large spikes so that they're lasting longer or the fat is hanging around for a long time before it goes back to normal. Uh, long term, we'll have more metabolic problems, gain weight, and have uh, increased hunger, lower energy. And that's what we're showing. So what we're trying to do is to match what people um, eat with these responses and how they eat with these responses. And we're finding that so many things influence the height of that response, even with the identical food. So the timing of the day uh, and whether you had something like a snack just before it or you had, a, for example, a, a, a high-carb breakfast before the lunch uh, will in, interfere with that second meal. So it's wow. all connected is what I'm saying. So this is why, uh, and it's not just the French, but the Italians, the Spanish, all the Mediterranean countries really don't snack uh, at all like we do. They don't usually have a big breakfast, and many of them skip it, and they, but they would always 
have a, a decent sized lunch where they take time out, at least half an hour to eat it. And in the evening they would have, you know, and they don't eat in their cars. They don't eat in, in front of the telly. Uh, they sit down and have them and they have more to eat, but they have less snacks. And, and I think this is probably where we've been going on. It's not just about calories. Uh, it's about the way we're eating and how that's changed in the last 30 years. I mean, obviously the, the quality of the food is also really important because it is so much better in those southern Mediterranean countries uh, than what we're eating. But I think Better, better in what sense, Tim? Less process, less sort of ultra processed and highly processed foods. What, what when we say better, what do we mean yeah, by no, that? Sure, you're very right to pull me up on the. On no, those I'm terms just <laughs> because uh, you know the whole point of what I'm writing about is that we shouldn't gauge quality of food by calories and fat level uh, or even sugar level. It, it's about uh, the natural. Uh, products, things that resemble the actual plants they came from rather than some derivative uh, put together as 20 chemicals. So people have different um, definitions of what ultra-processed food is, but if it's 10 or more chemicals and you don't, none of them are the original ones, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's not corn, it's the corn syrup or it's the, uh, the extract of yeah. something. That's uh, ultra-processed food that has nothing to do with the originals is poor quality food. In the UK, 50% uh, of our meals are ultra processed by those definitions. In the US, it's 60%. And in countries like uh, Portugal and Europe, it's 10%. Wow, there you go. And it's not because Portuguese are rich, uh, for those that don't know, it's just because they don't have a culture of eating this kind of uh, cheap, ready meal, uh, frozen foods that we've been overrun with. And it's no surprise that in Europe, you know, we are the fattest and in the world, the US are the fattest. It's, it's a direct correlation. Yeah, I mean, you could almost, just that stat there with in Portugal, 10% of their food comes from ultra processed food products. For, mm. uh, that in itself, Tim, if I, if I think about that, that could almost cut right through all the dietary tribal wars right there in the sense that is it carbs v fat v protein that's the issue or actually is it simply that the food that you are eating let's make it minimally processed let's actually make it more close to its natural state you know it, it, it's hard for me to draw any other conclusion. As I get in certain instances, you can play around with macronutrients and get a good outcome. I, I, I get that. I've done that before with patients. But but by and large, I'm not sure if we're, we're going down the right road there. It's the, the massive, the billion dollar food companies that have been setting the, the agenda about research have, have managed to avoid any decent studies comparing uh, junk foods against normal foods. And they've continued to fund all this work about low calorie products, low fat products, and kept these in the guidelines without ever talking about this other sort of element in the room because it's not in their interest. Because every year they're selling us more of this stuff that gets relatively cheaper compared to the um, nat more natural foods that you know have a proper food matrix and don't just get you know, instantly dissolved as soon as they hit your stomach. Yeah. Um, and they've had this vested interest in doing this. And that's why we're, we're deluded into make, having ridiculous TV programs about calorie counting and uh, the dangers of fats and, and, and this obsession on our labels, which most people don't understand anyway, which detract, yeah. again, from the quality. And only a few countries have got this. Only a few countries. And, but, you know, there's some examples in the book, and I was quite... A few in South America, like Chile, have managed to take on the companies and the government and managed to get... Instead of a food label, they just have a black dot that says, ultra-processed, avoid. And all the kids now understand that. And they took off the cartoon animals off the cereal packets. You know, in the same way... We did, we did with smoking cigarette yeah. packets. It was no longer had, we used to have cowboys on them and glamorous women and various other yeah. things. It's it, you know it's not different. Um, it, it's the same way. But 
this is, you know, and, the, and it's all a smokescreen to cover up the fact that every year we're eating more and more uh, ultra processed junk food that has just got more and more chemicals to alter the mouthfeel so it, it makes up for the lack of natural stuff. And it's, it's hurting our, it, and by having it sort of, you, it doesn't lend itself to a good meal. And so it lends itself to this perpetually snacking, grazing uh, world, which is really bad metabolically for us. Yeah. And the one study that was done on, on this um, has clearly shown that you, you get these two matched meals, this randomized group that was done by the NIH. Uh, just over a, a year ago, um, and you know the, there's a clear difference in appetite and going back for more. If you give people buffets of both, they liked both foods equally. Um, they were done to be highly appetizing, but the processed food made people. It didn't satisfy them. They, they kept going want back for more, so they ended up eating thirty percent more. Yeah, that was Kevin Hall's study, I think, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, remarkable. But what was remarkable is just how few studies there are like that. Yeah. Why? Um, you'd think, you know, this is these are like drugs we take every day of our lives. If it was a medicine, um, every time there was a new uh, processed food product, it would have to go through some testing, you know, and, and the pharmaceutical companies have to spend a billion dollars to get a new drug. Uh, these guys say, okay, it's fine. And if you complain, they say, well, you can't prove it's um, bad for us. Therefore, it's fine. So they've reversed the whole they've argument. Yeah, I know. I know. And you take that with, you know, I, I have this particular, particular thing about artificial sweeteners. Yeah. Um, and um, I've had arguments with these, these companies and, you know, and they have these pressure groups and, you know, action against sugar and they're sort of sponsored by the artificial sweetener companies. And, um, it, and their view is, well, show us a study that proves it's dangerous. And I would say, well, you don't do that for drugs. You have to first prove it's not harmful. Yeah, show us a study that proves <laughs> it's safe, right? But in the diet myth, I think you spoke about artificial sweeteners and I'm pretty sure you expressed a bit of concern about them. Uh, so what is your current view on artificial sweeteners? All the data suggests that when you do a clinical trial and you give kids or uh, overweight adults, um, uh, either two cans of, of fizzy drinks with sugar or two cans of the diet equivalent, uh, and you do that for six months or, or so, you do not see any difference in weight or uh, diabetes risk or any other metabolic parameters. So there's no clear benefit from swapping from someone from a sugar drink to uh, a a diet drink, except uh, maybe for if you for your dentist. Okay, so the dentists like it because definitely it, it it's uh, good for your teeth. Um, and so that just that fact alone, think about it. In each, you know, the average can will have maybe 150 calories, so people have two a day at least. It's 300 calories less. Why are these why are these kids and these adults not losing some weight? No, it wouldn't be massive, but you know, we're told that that would be about 15% of our um, intakes, right? So if yeah. you believe the calories in, calories out, actually, they should lose weight. They don't. So clearly, in my view, something else is happening uh, metabolically to these, to these individuals. Either their brain is being reset by the sweetness chemicals, so it's at a neural level, or uh, something is happening metabolically and you are getting some change in insulin in ways we still don't understand. And I've put myself with monitors and given myself sucralose and I can see, uh, I, I do get a sugar peak, uh, and my insulin peak, strangely, with wow. the sweetness, which I can't explain. Or more likely, it's affecting our gut microbes. And so they don't know how to deal with these chemicals, which are all derived from things like petrol and um, uh, paraffin, uh, very ultra things that we're never supposed to eat. And so they, they produce weird chemicals in response. And those chemicals then have a reaction on our body, which um, interferes with the metabolism and in a way either makes us put on some weight or, or predisposes to diabetes in the same way as the sugar. So 
uh, we don't know the mechanisms yet. There may be differences between them. They definitely work in different ways. And some people might be okay with some and not with others because, you know, I admit everyone is, is unique. But I think the whole idea of uh, reducing sugar by just adding uh, unlimited amounts of these chemicals, which is, you know, one side effect of the, the sugar levy, yeah. um, has to be thought through. And we should be weaning people off ultra sweetened products, which make them more likely, particularly kids, to, to seek sugar and avoid sour things, which may be good for them. Uh, and that's my major worry. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing whether stevia, for example, which would appear to be the more natural of these ones, does have any particular benefits. But I suspect that this whole sweetness thing, by artificially creating these, these sort of flavors that people crave, um, is going to have some other knock-on effects down the line that we don't know. So we should be treat, teaching kids and, and you know adults how to go back to enjoying things that uh, like water or like teas and um, uh, it, herbal teas and things that have a bit of interest in it rather than this this blunderbuss massive amounts of sugar, yeah. uh, whether it's fake or real. It's amazing. You know, my kids are sort of 10 and 7 at the moment, and it's amazing how many of their friends don't drink water. They're allergic. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? It's kind of, it, it's, it's, it's really sad, actually, on, mm. on, a, on, a, on a deep level, because I think if you think about it in, in terms of our evolutionary heritage, we could never have survived if we didn't drink water. Right, you know, five hundred years ago, I don't think we had the choice to not drink water. Whereas now we have that choice, and I suspect it's because it's being conditioned out of them uh, via society, by averse and choices that they've been given. Um, because I just fundamentally cannot believe that a human being cannot drink water. But I, but just to be super compassionate to parents who are listening who might struggle with their own children. I get it. I get it can be tough, but actually it's very unnatural to not, to not drink water. No, uh, totally agree. But I think it's, as you said, part of conditioning. And, uh, you know, I go into the water business in the book in a fair way. And, you know, we've been conditioned that tap water is perhaps bad for us and uh, it tastes bad or um, has metallic things in it or there've been you know history of you go abroad and ever say, well don't don't drink the water you know what are you gonna it could be deadly uh and that that fueled this whole rise in um mineral waters and uh this con that basically you know pepsi and, and coca-cola and nestle take tap water and they they just stick it through uh, a processing plant and um, rebottle it, uh, minus any taste, and uh, do that. But uh, and then then have to add some uh, flavorings to it, as they they were doing with um, for kids to add a twist of fake lime or uh, <laughs> orange to make it palatable. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. I think we really important. We get kids taste back, re reset the thermostat away from this super sweetness that uh, is the problem because they, they can't then appreciate other foods because in a way everything's set so high yeah. uh, that they need it. I, I, I love that phrase, reset the thermostat. That's exactly what it is really. Um, I think, I can't remember how I put it in my, in my very first book. Uh, the, I wrote about, you know, if a child, you know, a hundred years ago, you know, the taste of a ripe peach on a, you know, a nice, in the peak of summer, that would be like a treat. It would be, man, this is so gorgeous and sweet. Whereas I think if you're used to having things like Haribo's or, um, you know, every day, and that becomes your definition or your normal sweetness as a packet of sweets, then of course a peach no longer holds the magical allure that it used to. Yeah. And, and I think it's just been this steady downgrading of our taste buds without... when did you have a last have a grape that was slightly tangy you know yeah. when i was a kid they were always a bit sour and uh you know there was the odd sweet one but you you, you like that sweet sour sort of mix but they've virtually disappeared now they're all bred for super sweetness yeah and so you just can't get uh you don't we're losing that range 
yeah. of, of taste because and I think a lot of this is because of sugar and artificial sweeteners and the fact that um, it is uh, kids are brought up you know through this uh, this mechanism and, and and that has a knock-on effect on the ability then to taste you know to have bitter vegetables and uh, and all these other things so I, think, I, think, I think it's such an important point I want, I want to keep just on the topic of children uh, when I was refreshing myself this morning uh, with the book uh, just as a as sort of preparation for our conversation today. I don't think I'm giving away the book when I can read the last the punch, line. The punch can, line. Can I read the last line of the book? I think it's, okay. for me, one of the most important lines okay. in, a, in a book on foods. Education is our main hope. We need to be teaching our children about real and fake foods with the same zeal that we teach them how to walk, read, and write. Tim, that really hit me. When I, when I read it this morning, um, you know, I, I've got two young kids. Until they went to school, I felt we had a pretty good handle on what they were eating, how much, when, you know, you know. Since going to school, particularly as they're getting older and older, obviously that, that control, and maybe all parents struggle with this, goes away from you somewhat. But what's interesting to me is what is normal in schools now? Okay, now, appreciate your kids are a bit older than mine. So I don't know if that, that's changed. I wonder if you had this experience when you were uh, a, a dad of young kids, although maybe you weren't tuned into nutrition in the same way as you are now. But there's a snacking culture that's promoted, right? So morning break is snack time. You have to have a snack, right? It's, you know, it's just, it's part of the school timetable. There's morning snack time, afternoon snack time, which of course we were mentioning before how snacking is, a reasonably modern invention, certainly to the degree that we have it in this country. Um, I know this is controversial, but I wonder if you could elaborate on some of your views on nutrition in schools and what we possibly should be doing. Well, everything you said is um, absolutely true around this country and probably uh, very prevalent in places like Australia and the, and, and the US. And it is different from when I was at school. So we didn't have a, a mid-morning break f for snacks. We were expected to last until lunch without fainting. And I think this, this whole idea, and it, it, it all comes to this idea that you, know, you, you have to give kids regular food, otherwise their blood sugar level drops and uh, they can't concentrate and they run amok. And this... Uh, this idea was probably came about it was a brilliant idea probably for some marketing marketing executive uh selling selling you know chocolate biscuits or or you know one of these big companies and so they started it and then probably did a lot of really bad promoted a lot of bad studies in nutrition departments to show there was some correlation between uh kids who ran amok and uh, them not getting a, a snack at uh, at ten thirty, right? They didn't get a chocolate fix or whatever. They didn't get their chocolate finger, and the, and they did a correlation. They ran a mock. Well, the fact that little Johnny who ran a mock uh, was the sort of kid who would just forget to <laughs> to, to pick up his satchel or whatever, um, or you know had refused breakfast because he was you know a bit hyper. Um, it was irrelevant because that became ingrained in in uh, sort of pediatrics and in uh, school education that it was really important to keep maintaining sort of high sugar levels uh, in school, and it, and this is where the problems absolutely start. So wh why why I think this is so important, Tim, is because if kids get ingrained and conditioned with this from the age of three, four, five, six, seven, it is so hard to change that conditioning later. And, you know, we've not put this video out. I met it with, with Gareth last week uh, about, you know, s food in schools. And I personally believe in the current climate where one in three kids in the UK start secondary school overweight and obese. And we know how much the environment influences our choices, you know, and some would argue, are they even choices in a very obesogenic environment? I really struggle to to make the case that schools should have vending machines anymore with, 
fizzy drinks and with chocolate bars with crisps. I can't see the case for an ice cream van in the middle of a big secondary school anymore. But I feel sometimes as so though saying that, it for some reason that's quite controversial to say that. It's almost as if, you know, when I've spoken to teachers about it, and some teachers say, some teachers agree, but they say, well, I'm t- we're too scared of parents and what they'll say, so we don't change anything. And other teachers say, well, we want our children to have choice. But I think, I don't think people understand true choice. I don't think they understand what goes on, the bliss point of food, how they're manufactured to particularly, you know, spike that dopamine beautifully well. So, you know, I don't think people get it right. There's no choice. If you put a big pile of chocolate biscuits in front of me now, I'd have a nibble, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because they're specially designed uh, for that. And kids are so vulnerable. Uh, But I agree. It's like a religion. and, and, And some people, and many parents feel, you know, they've been educated the same way. They've been indoctrinated the same way. And they feel they would be really bad parents if they let that kid have a sugar dip or, you know, the energy level went down. Because such is this dogma that uh, if you don't have some carbs, you know, your sugar level drops, your energy goes down. And and what we've shown in our recent studies and the PREDICT study is complete opposite. You actually have a sugar dip after you have a carb load. So it is the complete opposite of what everyone thinks. And, uh, and so what they're doing is they are giving their kid, if you give your kid a, a chocolate biscuit or whatever it is at, at 10 o'clock, they're going to have a sugar dip and a third of them will have real problems of fatigue and concentration for the next hour. We've, we've done these studies in adults, not in children, but it you know, it, there are, we see these sugar dippers. They don't know they're dipping because we've got these monitors on them. They don't know what's happening. Uh, and they report their concentration levels, their fatigue levels. And it is not because they're not eating. It's, it's after they've had that uh, sugar load. Uh, in our case, it was muffins. But the point is exactly the same, that it is madness to think that uh, this happens. And you only got to look I mean, I, I was in Tanzania um, with this hunter-gatherer tribe, and I get asked this all the time, you know, oh, uh, everyone needs breakfast, otherwise you can't concentrate. Um, they didn't have a word for breakfast uh, because it didn't exist. Uh, no one was there, you know, up at dawn getting everything ready to, uh, so otherwise they couldn't make it through the day. Nobody ate anything before about 10, 10.30. Um, and usually just wait until lunch. But the, the point was that these people, you know, they would go hunting. They didn't need uh, the equivalent of a chocolate biscuit to uh, keep them going, otherwise they'd faint. Uh, evolutions, you know, wouldn't do that. You know, it's madness. And so we've actually been poisoning ourselves with the exact opposite. Uh, and But as you, as you can see from the reaction of teachers and parents, it is so ingrained this idea that uh, you're a bad parent if you don't do this. Yeah, and what it, what, um, the other thing which happens, and I know many of my listeners will resonate with this bit in particular, that what it does is that when you're trying to educate and bring up your kids to know the value of food and know the value that it's for physical health, mental health, for mood, focus, concentration, et cetera, et cetera, if you subscribe to the view as I do that school should be the model educationally, behaviorally, but also nutritionally, then you just start to create that friction where, well, mommy and daddy are telling me one thing at home, Mm. but like at school, you know, yesterday my son said, uh, you know, I said, hi guys, how was it? And, you know, school and everyone goes, yeah, you know what, you know what my friends had today? They had pizza and chips for lunch. Um, And we don't, you know, what's really tricky is that I'm not saying that that is something that no one should ever eat, right? I get it. But I actually feel that schools are taking away some of the parental choice and responsibility because why not let parents decide if and when they want to give their kids a bit of sugar or uh, a cake or a dessert? I know what I'm saying is against the grain of what a lot of people now think, um, but, but I really do think schools need to, need to take this seriously. No, I think they need to take responsibility because what they are doing is, is for the rest of that kid's life, they're dictating what's normal. 
Exactly. And, and, and so, yeah, you can have parents that are stricter or more relaxed, but your idea of authority and what's, you know, the way the rules are yeah. is that the rule is little Johnny has, uh, you know, a car break at, at 10 o'clock and another one at three o'clock and he has, he can eat whatever he likes at, at lunch. And that is just plain wrong. And, you know, and it, it all, and it's again, because of brainwashing, you know, you can't blame any of these because no, no. there is no, there's no great expert that stands up there, for, you know, uh, you know, in England, we've got Jamie Oliver who who tried to do this and got a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, flack. A lot of flack for trying to, to do this. But he didn't take on really the whole concept of how much you need to eat during the day. And, you know, this this idea, I was brought up on uh, this, that grazing was better than gorging. Uh, I talk about the book. And, you do, yeah. And it ended up this pathetic study of about, you know, 10 people uh, done 30 years ago that, um, doesn't stand up to any scrutiny, and yet this one study, you know, has had had ramifications because obviously this whole industry came around it, and people felt, you know, what it's really important to keep people, um, you know, topped up. And uh, how are you going to top up these kids? Because otherwise they'll go crazy. And so suddenly it was a, a guilt thing if you if you took it away, and then they did something, then the parents would blame them and then that, then it, yeah. this responsibility comes up. So it's going to take someone brave to do this. Yeah. Uh, but I just hope that you know, some people will read the book and say, well, okay, well, you can blame me now. Um, I, you know, some head, head teacher might be listening, say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to change this. Let's give it a go for a, a term, uh, you know, and uh, yeah. be unpopular, but give these kids something, some semblance of what really is normal. Yeah. And what other kids in healthier countries are doing. But there are studies, Tim, that have shown, like I've seen numerous studies where they've shown that if a, if, if a kid has, you know, let's say they have breakfast before they go to school, but it's, let's say, based on real food, like, you know, good source of protein, let's say eggs, or I can't remember what exactly was in the study, but it, it showed clearly that actually that sort of breakfast can actually not only sustain them, but improve performance at school as well, which again, doesn't, doesn't really surprise anyone if you understand the impact that nutrition can have all over the body. And I agree, you know, maybe someone will read your book, maybe a head teacher will and go, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do this for three, for three minutes. I think it will take that kind of strong leadership. And, and, and I, I thought long and hard about this, but I feel so strongly about it in my next book, which is on uh, how to lose weight in a responsible and sustainable way. I've got a section on schools in there and I'm going to direct people to the, to my website where I've written letters that people can use to send to their headmasters to try and actually make it easy for teachers and for parents who feel strongly, more for parents who to go, you know what, I felt I wasn't sure what to do, but if I and my mum's WhatsApp group, we all download that letter and send it in, maybe in our school, this, you know, a change will start to happen. And I, I don't know if it will have an impact or not. Maybe we can talk about teaming up for that and see if we can do something. Because I really think if we get it right for our kids now, then maybe in 15, 20 years, actually, they'll be the ones who are adults and they possibly won't have all the problems <laughs> that much of the adult population has today. But also the, the kids will uh, teach their parents. Yeah. So I mean, what we all forget is, you know, kids have a big influence on the family as well, you know, and it's not always that the other yeah. direction. So I, I think, yeah, if we keep failing our kids and, you know, a lot of the agenda in schools has been driven by the food companies, you know, this idea that you can have as much sugar as you like as long as you go into the playground. Yeah. Um, just complete nonsense. And it, it's all been funded by, you know, big food and drink companies yeah. and to distract us from the rubbish and yeah. distract us from the, the idea that, you know, we – we're just feeding these kids rubbish food all the time. They don't know what different vegetables are, uh, and they and they they're no wiser about how to cook or yeah. uh, understand what natural ingredients are. You know, really hasn't changed at all uh, since I was at school. You know, if you're lucky, you might be able to make a bad brownie. You know, that's about the, the extent of it. And yet, you know, everyone really now, once you get you know beyond middle age, you do realise that nutrition is probably the most important. 
thing you can be educated in. Yeah. Because, um, you know, and there's no reason that nutrition shouldn't be and food shouldn't be at the heart of the curriculum. You know, whether you study the science of it, the ecology of it, you know, the environment is becoming so important. Um, you know, many things we don't need to learn in school. Yeah. You know, we hardly anyone uses algebra. And yet, um, for the 99% of people who never use it, they're told it. Well, you know, let's start changing some of the um, things that we do insist on curricula. Yeah. And what we're talking about schools, you know, you know same goes in medical school, but, you know, uh, in a way that's, that's a whole other conversation. That's a, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but, but I, but I think you know, and and in a way, you know, I, I think getting it right for schools and teachers is probably more important. Um, and again, it's this this idea of, you know, from the ground up. I, uh, I think teachers will love it, Sim, because actually, teachers will find actually that their kids. Because I, I, you know, teachers probably go into education. I'm guessing most of them because they enjoy imparting knowledge and wisdom and uh, and inspiring a generation of kids to think about the world in a certain way. Mm. You're gonna have more engaged kids when they've been fed properly, when they don't have blood sugar roller coasters in lesson, when they're going to be moody, they're going to be more attentive and more switched on to what you're trying to teach. So I actually think there are there are benefits. The same goes for workplaces if they helped encourage, you know, no, no one wants to be out, you know, no one wants their employer to tell them what to eat, but there are ways to sort of not make it easy to eat junk, right? I think that's, that's where I come down on it a little bit. Um, but Tim, right, you, you mentioned before, and that's, if we go back to your personalized nutrition studies. So I can't stop thinking about what you said before, that if you snack or, or in, some of, in some patients, if they snack before a meal, it changes their metabolic response to that meal. So I wonder if we could just dive into that a little bit. So let's say you're going to have your dinner at 6 p.m. But at 4.30 p.m., you have, I don't know, a cake, piece of cake, you know, with a cup of tea. How might that impact the same meal that someone has at 6 p.m. if they've not had that cake? Well, it's going to vary for different people because yeah. I've told you there's this uh, unique response. But we're generally seeing a higher uh, insulin and glucose peak. Uh, if they've snacked before. If they've snacked before. So there'd be more stress on the body uh, having snacked than if they hadn't eaten at all. Um, it will depend on the time of day and other things like this, because again, it's not a simple you know, black and white type relationship. Sure. But, but everything that you eat, you do before you have whatever it is you're eating has a role in that response to that meal. And so... Uh, for most people who have anything to eat before that time uh, that will induce a sugar surge will cause an even bigger one in the subsequent meal. Okay, so so this is why once you start thinking of food in a different way as a chemical reaction in, a, in your body, you realize that you don't want to have these big sugar peaks, these fat peaks after food. You want to, you know, you accept some of them, but you want to balance it for your body so that your body's not overreacting all the time and in a sort of stressed, inflamed state, which is what we think is happening for people on very bad diets. They're just constantly stressing the body. The insulin is being pumped up. Inflammation levels go up. Vessels start getting inflamed. Long-term stress equals weight gain and you know concentration problems and uh, energy problems. So, what? You know, getting a good night's sleep, having a good rest between meals, um, trying to work out whether you should be eating your food early in the morning or late at night, depending on your particular circadian rhythm. All these things are important, but absolutely, we should be eating less meals. We should be having two decent meals a day um, rather than this standard six, which we are now uh, being told it is still the right way to eat. Oh, and by the you know, just happen to be this these these uh, cheap snack foods you can you can buy that parents are told is good for their children. You know, and it's just complete nonsense. Uh, we have to break that cycle, realize, break it down again, and start you know people experimenting and getting people used to and kids particularly. You know, 
you imagine a child that's used to eating six or seven times a day, how do they cope with a fast? You know, the, the, you know after two, two hours, they're, they're conditioned to start looking for something else to eat. Uh, whereas the French kid, the Spanish kid, the Italian kid, they'll be patient, they'll wait, you know, and they'll wait for some decent food. And I think that's the other thing. It's this conditioning that's yeah. maybe just as bad as this metabolic uh, problem. So, yeah, and I think that the uncomfortable truth for, for many of us as parents is that our behavior can also condition our own kids, right? So what they mm-hmm. see us doing, and if we've, let's say, picked up habits that maybe ideally we would change, but we haven't, yet our kids are around us and seeing it, they're also going to pick up that as well. And I think, you know, I say that as a reminder to myself, just be careful how much you snack. You know, it's not it's not like looking down on anyone. It's it's purely understanding that we're, we're all susceptible. Um, but these religious, you know, but uh, I'm a big fan of, you know, fasting and, and virtually every religion has had fasting in there as a way of training, um, you know, as, as a sort of health thing and bonding the community together. But I think it's a great training for for kids uh, to be able to fast for a period of time, to so, realize that you don't, you're not going to die if you don't <laughs> eat, you know, and you, you just wait until the next day or, uh, you know, when the sun goes down or whatever it is. Uh, and, and it's very sad that we, you know, it's slowly being lost. And certainly in the Christian world, it's virtually lost. Uh, and it's only the other, other religions that do it, but, uh, but, Bringing back, you know, some non-religious fast day yeah. um, for the whole family might be a, a fun thing that everyone should do, you know, that um, with well, a big feast at the end to, yeah. uh, to celebrate. Yeah, you're right. This sort of feast famine type pattern that we've no doubt had in evolution. How can we bring that back? When you say you're a fan of fasting, um, what do you mean by fasting? Because if I don't clarify this, we'll get a ton of questions afterwards. What do you mean by fasting? Are you talking about intermittent fasting, time restricted eating, how many hours? You know, all those questions will come up. So I'd love to know, what, what does Professor Tim Spector think of fasting? Well, firstly, uh, everything in moderation. So I'm not uh, someone who believes in multiple day fasting. Um, you know, I've never fasted for more than 24 hours and uh, I you know, wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but I, I do think, just in general principle, the idea of going on a fast psychologically is really important so that you remember what hunger is really like, and you remember that you can distract yourself from hunger, and that also you can paint a nice picture of you know, having this enormous breakfast the next day, and amazingly, you can fall asleep and get around it. So until I started doing it, I, I didn't believe that was sort of possible. <laughs> so yeah. I, I thought I'm too weak. I'm not going to, be able to do that. But so the, just the principle of any any fast, um, it, it's quite a, just a thing to do for your own psychological well-being, I think, uh, to realize that we've, you know, we've got this We've got these chemicals in our brain, and they're telling us to do this. And but you can switch them off. You can divert them. You know, when you don't have to, it's fine. And most of us will come across some medical thing that we have to fast. Yeah. Uh, but you, we're usually just distracted by that medical thing that we do it. And if you t- and that, that's interesting, that uh, yeah. that's quite easy. Um, but when you do it voluntarily, it's somewhat harder. So the principle is, I, I like it. Um, I was a big fan of uh, intermittent fasting. When it first came out, because it allowed you to um, eat less food, but not in a restricted way. So you could have, a, you could pick what the food was you were going to eat, and just had only a quarter of the amount on that day. And I don't think it was shown to be better than any other diets, but you could stay on it for longer because you had the variety. You could change it all. It wasn't dull. It didn't, you know, didn't interfere with uh, anything else. And um, when you say intermittent fasting, Tim, can you would you mind just elaborating on what that means exactly? Okay, so intermittent fasting, I'm talking about things like the five two diet. So you would have um, two days during the week, not consecutive, where you would have 25 percent of your normal calories, and or or some people would have less, but yeah. it, it would be the idea that you'd really reduce it down. Um, 
maybe just have an apple and uh, a bit of clear soup and um, uh, something in the evening. I always had a glass of red wine as a treat in the evening, but uh, which, which used up most of my uh, allowance. Um, uh, and then the next day you, you could compensate, do whatever you liked, really. So that, that it was a, and you could do that for two days a week. And most people found they did lose weight or as a way of controlling weight that didn't give you the, the same uh, rebound that you got with uh, calorie counting or doing anything like that. Now, like all things, it turns out to be not as you know, amazing as, as we, th we thought, uh, but it, it did allow a lot of people to carry on doing it for years. And I do have people who have been doing it for years. Uh, and every now and again, they just say, okay, I'll just have a hungry day and do that. And to my mind, because they're not changing the food they eat, it can still be healthy. I like that. It's not like they're having something out of a can or a, you know, artificial uh, milkshake or a, yeah. a low cal product. They're not going and saying, I'm going to get zero calorie this and that. You can have exactly normal natural foods. Um, but I think what is interesting at the moment is that is time restricted feeding. Yeah. Um, which is a lot of the news at the moment. Um, and has very uh, a lot of animal data supporting it, but so far hasn't lived up to expectations in the clinical trials. Interestingly, so there have been a couple of trials recently where it hasn't sh shown to be as dramatic as you would expect from the um, uh, the the animal studies. And it could be that again, this individuality. We, those trials always look at the averages. Yeah, and. It could be that some people would benefit from a different time scale. Um, for some people, it isn't enough. Some people might be too much. And so I would still advise everybody to give it a go. And particularly this idea of whether you're a morning person or an evening person. In our studies, um, when we gave identical muffins to people every uh, three hours or every four hours across the day, uh, most people's um, metabolic peaks, these, these these stress peaks I was telling you about, got less uh, during the day. Um, so uh, yes, so no, the other way they 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 went up during the day. So three out of four people got worse during the day with the same food. Um, one in four people actually uh, got better. So, and I was one of them. So it suggests that. Uh, for some people, eating later in the day would be better than eating early in the day. So some people are morning people, and like the dogma tells us, you metabolize better your carbohydrates in the morning, you break it down quicker, you get less of a sugar peak eating the identical food. And we compared lots of people doing this. But one in four people, it's the opposite. Wow. So some people are better off not having a large breakfast, um, or so either skipping breakfast and having uh, a lunch and a, and a big evening meal, like most people in the Mediterranean, uh, those people will do better. So again, it's all about self-experimentation. There isn't one size fits all. And there's many complicated bits go into food. Yeah. And it, it, it's necessary to maybe deconstruct it all without losing the you know the fun bits of eating, yeah. Because there is this huge social side that's really important, mustn't lose sight of. But let's not stop eating breakfast just because everyone says you have to eat breakfast. And they say, "Well, mummy, I'm not hungry." Well, you know, try it for a week without breakfast and see. Yeah. You know, it's not going to kill them. Um, and if it doesn't work out, you you know, you change your mind. But generally, humans are pretty good at. If you listen to your body, it will yeah. tell you. Most people are not starving when they wake up in the morning. You don't wake up at 7.30 say, oh my God, you know, I've got to eat something, you know? <laughs> and so that, and some people, they don't get any feeling of hunger until, you know, maybe 11, 12 o'clock. Yeah. I think the main thing for me is if I sort of, which what I always try and do is try and relay what you're telling me from the science and this kind of cutting edge science that you're involved with, and I'm sort of trying to relay it to what I've seen with my own patients. Go, well, how does that marry up with what I've seen? It really fits so beautifully that, first of all, everyone's different. Secondly, we got us, I think we've got to 
it's about empowerment and responsibility in the sense that I think too, too many of us are relying on some external source to tell us what is the right diet for us. You know, doctor, you tell me, what should I eat? And, and I think we can provide guidance, but I kind of feel the only way to really own it long-term is for you to feel it and go, actually, you know what? I don't really care what anyone else is doing because when I have my breakfast at 10 a.m., and let's say I eat until I have a dinner at 7 p.m., actually, you know what? That seems to work for me. Yeah, I know my best mate has breakfast at 7 a.m. and he seems to be thriving, but it, it's kind of just about, and I think there's something in society, Tim, there's something that has really changed over the last 50, 100 years. I, I just wonder, actually, in some ways, it's interesting, isn't it? Nutrition always used to be taught to us by our parents or our grandparents and our local community. And as communities have become more dispersed and we've moved away from family, and of course, many of us have emigrated to different countries and set up new homes and new lives, we're now almost looking for you know, scientists and researchers and doctors to tell us how to eat. And again, I appreciate I'm a doctor trying to encourage people to eat well. You're a doctor, you're a researcher. But do you know what I mean? Is there something, is that not in some ways part of the problem? Yeah, we're, 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 it's the missing grandmother generation, really, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's this cultural void, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, you know, since the Second World War, we just haven't had this, uh, this, these experts uh, who told us what good food was. This is good traditional food. I'll teach you how to make it for your kids. You know, this is what it looks like. Everyone knows how to make that dish, for example. Yeah. And they know what the raw ingredients are. They can, you know, chop up the onions and, and do it all. And that is passed on. And that still exists. Southern Mediterranean has it. Northern Europe doesn't have it. But, you know, every single kid in, in South Korea knows how to make a kimchi. Um, and they eat it two or three times a day. And, their you know, their grandmother has their own special recipe and they pride themselves on knowing their national dish well, and being experts in it. And we have nothing, nothing at all. Well, I, I sometimes feel that we're swimming against the tide here, you know, in terms of what populist opinion is. I mean, you, you said before, you, you mentioned something, you get attacked. You know, how do you feel individually, actually, as a, as, a, as a very esteemed and respected doctor, professor, researcher? How does it feel for you individually when you get blasted on social media? Um. Well, I realize that A, I'm, I'm relatively protected because I'm uh, a, a respected professor in a, in a, in, and I do see a lot of the abuse that goes on to other people that's much more than I get. So I realize that I'm uh, relatively free of this. Um, I've got, it was quite hard. I used to get quite upset about it. Um, now I think it's quite funny or I try and work out you know, who they're working for. Um, or what their particular angle is. And once you see that, you know, you realize, well, you know, it's just like religious fundamentalism. It's, um, they're never going to be particularly happy. But I've, I've been fairly lucky that I'd, I'd, I'm quite hard to attack uh, because I do do the research and they can't say, well, they've done the research and it disproves me or whatever. It's a theory. Yeah. Um, but certain areas like, you know, I know I'll never win, um, and vitamins is one of them. Um, there are some areas that are really like fundamental religious beliefs that people feel very, very strongly about. And I don't think it matters what science uh, you, yeah. I produced. Uh, those people in their lifetimes will never, ever drop uh, that particular belief. Yeah. And um and that's it. It's a belief, right? That's and that's often what we're we're up against. Tim, you know, in the, the personalized nutrition, as someone who's had probably more uh, needles and tests done on them than possibly anyone on the planet, maybe. What have you changed in the way you eat since doing some of this testing? Well, ten years ago, I started changing really towards my gut, um, and I, I had this without a huge amount of evidence, just the idea that I wanted to feed my gut microbes was a pretty good principle to go on. And 
the last three years, I've been doing these more precision tests on myself with with monitors, with measuring my fat levels, et cetera, et cetera. And that's taught me about something. I got. I realized I got some things wrong. Um, and it's it's changed my breakfast, for example. And um, I now have really pretty much ditched the the carb breakfast. And will if I I try and skip breakfast a couple of times a week. Although I like breakfast, I, I feel slightly better without it. I was sort of conflicted because <laughs> 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 nothing quite like a really good breakfast. But if you're rushing it and you you know you, you don't need it, um, I try and skip it. But you know I will go for. Uh, the full fat yogurt, the kefir. I have fermented food every day now. I really, if I don't, I feel sort of uh, I'm lacking something, or I'm I feel guilty like a parent, you know, lacking down their poor microbes who got are starving. <laughs> My babies, they've got nothing to eat. Um, so I, I have a, a fat. I have fat and nuts, uh, maybe a small amount of fruit in the morning. Um, and by lunchtime, I've sort of said, I'm either going to have a proper lunch or I'm not going to have one. Right. And I, I feel if I'm working really hard, uh, I, I don't often feel, feel hungry enough that I absolutely have to stop and have lunch. Um, and it's probably not good for me to carry on working, I must say. So I, I, but on the times I do, I do have a proper break and then have a proper lunch. Otherwise, I will just have s- some nuts and... Uh, an apple, and I found that by cutting out bread at lunch times, I didn't get the sugar dips and spikes that I was was getting uh, when I had my hospital, you know, tuna and sweet corn sandwich. Uh, yeah. That uh, <laughs> always seemed to be the same, and you get into a rut about having that. But when you see that effect on your blood sugar, um, it, it really puts you off. Um, and so, and in the evening, um, you know, I really have whatever I like uh, that that's good and I, I don't really hold back so I think the the sugar monitor has really helped um, what did you have did you have one of these continuous monitors mm. which would sort of feed like bluetooth to your phone sort of yes. what was going on so you yeah, could really so, see in real time so what what sort of time would you have your evening meal now uh, it depends which country I'm in um, obviously I, so in Spain, you can't really eat before nine o'clock in the evening uh, when a lot of people are going to bed. But they don't, you know, and said they they don't seem to have problems with it because they don't eat much in the morning. So it's all about not about much the time you eat. It's perhaps when you go to sleep and then when you have your next meal. So it's the spacing out of the meals that is important. Um, so I, yeah, I what I try and do is at least twice a week um, have a fourteen hour fast until the next day yeah and i do feel better on that i've I've discovered that and i also try and exercise whether it's swimming or going for a run or cycling um uh you know not immediately after um i try to exercise first before before eating and that seems to suit me better as well it's interesting you've seen this in real time so one, one thing i'm super interested in because there's quite a bit of research out there. And again, these are all averages that people saying eating half, eating the bulk of your calories in the first half of the day seems to have a better uh, impact on, you know, sort of weight than actually if you have the, the bulk of the calories in the second half of the day. Now, of course, these are just averages. And I think, to be clear, I don't think they were saying it has to be a breakfast. It could even be a, you know, breakfast is what? meal one, right? So meal one can be at any time. I think even if it was at 10, 10.30 and people were eating most of their food by 4, 4.30, I've seen quite a few, I think at least three trials. And one of them was a Spanish one actually suggesting that actually there's a positive impact. Now, I get that's not the case for everyone. And it's not the, not the case for people who are older as well. We, we showed in our studies that there's an age effect. Right. So all these studies generally done on students in nutrition departments right so they're right. generally in their 20s uh but increasingly as you as you get older these patterns shift and these circadian patterns this this morning predominance is gets lost and so it's uh much weaker when you you, know, you get over 50 is it really yeah. that's super interesting and i think really for me that almost the work you're doing <laughs> 
in some ways it makes all previous studies redundant in some way because if they haven't taken into account individual variation then it's very hard to draw you know we can draw an average conclusion but then as you say you know for that individual it's like well the trial says that but that ain't working for me and Um, you need to look at the trial in real detail and say okay these are 20 year old americans or whatever am i you know as a, you know, a forty-year-old, you know, non-American in another country, is this really appropriate for me? You know, why don't they show a wider range of individuals, yeah. ages? You know, realize that it, it's far more complex than they're showing, and that you need to do your own experiment in some way. And hopefully, we will soon be able to do that. You know, these these what, with, with everyone having their own monitor. Yeah, or? I think so. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, the company I'm working with, Zoe, uh, you know, launched a couple of weeks ago. The product in the US. So you can, for a few hundred dollars, buy the product in the US, do four weeks of testing in a way, get your own scores, um, get your own report, and then go and then see how you get on just by using uh, an app that tells you what yeah. your scores are. And then you work out, does that, you know, how do I feel on that? And you can actually do your own proof, which is a, a faster way than spending six months trying to do it yourself. Uh, but I think the general principle is that these devices, these tests, the microbiome testing, all these things that input into these predictions are going to get much cheaper, much more yeah. available. And we're all, all going to be using a, an app, uh, I think, that's personalized for us You know, within, within five or 10 years. Wow. I, I, I just think it's the most only logical way to deal with a complex problem because you know, I've just given you a, a little snapshot of how complicated these things are yeah. about just eating one meal. And But if this is reduced by some algorithm to tell you your score is this, you can then make some lifestyle choices based on that and then have a much, you know, do two weeks of that and see, does that work for you or not? You know, um, I, I think that the, 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 the real beauty of doing it individually is that you're really empowered to make a change when you see it on yourself right Mm. when it's not someone else's data i actually i nearly got a blood sugar monitor at the start of the summer and i think i just got busy with the book edits which frankly took me all summer um i thought oh i'll get that in and then i'll I'll play around with with and seeing you know what happens to my blood sugar after certain meals so i didn't get that but i did get the sleep uh tracking device which i think is is certainly from what I can tell, one of the best ones out there. And what's really interesting for me is that if I eat close to my bedtime, within within two hours of bedtime, it takes a lot longer for my heart rate to drop at night. And I can see that in real time when I've played around with it. And, and that affects you know, your readiness score the next day and how much you've recovered. And it affects, certainly for me, my levels of deep sleep. So when I see that consistently and play around with it, I'm like, ah, okay, I know that that is not suiting me. So I've literally changed that. So I won't eat now. Very rarely will I eat within two or three hours of bed. It's very much, even if I get that pang at nine, 9.30, I'm like, ah, you know what? I'm not going to do it. And and that A, the feeling goes, because half the time you're not really hungry. It's just you're a bit bored and you just want something in your mouth. But I kind of see the same thing with blood sugar monitoring, right? It must be when you see it for yourself, you're then empowered to make that, that that change. Have you seen anything or have you done any work yet within the data about eating close to bedtime? Because I'm guessing in Spain, yes, they eat late, but I think they go to bed later as well, don't they? Yeah, everything's later. So it's like jet lag. You just sort of, uh, uh, they never go to bed before one. So um, yeah. You can so t- they may still not be eating for two hours before bed potentially. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't go to bed straight after eating, no. Yeah. So, and they wouldn't eat in the morning so they'd have a longer... Because I mean, you've got the you've got the you're looking at it just from one point of time. Yeah. Whereas actually, you might say, well, actually, you know, what about your metabolism at lunchtime? You know, after you've had that, I mean, yeah, it's all related. Yeah. And what did you have the day before? And should you be exercising before or after meals? You know, how does that change your metabolism? But that, that that's only blood sugar, though, isn't it? Because you guys are measuring three things: blood sugar. Uh, triglycerides in the blood, and also um, what was the other thing you're measuring? Inflammation. So you're measuring three things. Can you get a lot of that from just the blood sugar? 
because a lot of a lot of self experimenters are getting the blood sugar testing and doing that but you obviously in your testing are doing it a lot more you know there's there's two more parameters so what what can we take from that i mean yeah i mean blood sugar alone certainly picks up things like having a real pre-diabetic tendency you know knowing whether you really have a problem with carbs the sugar dips um but it doesn't tell you whether you should be replacing everything with fats or not, because some people have problems with fats and they don't. If you just, the easiest way to get a bed, good blood sugar reading is just to have fat. You just put butter and cream on everything and it wipes out the sugar response. So everything that's just based on sugar has always got that flaw that um, you're never quite sure whether you're doing so more harm or not because you don't know what your, your six hour. Um, triglyceride is whether those fats are going to be hanging around your body all overnight, uh, causing inflammation, giving you heart disease, all these kind of things. Yeah. Which, so I think it is important to do both, but you can certainly get a lot of insights. And it's just, I think, just psychologically really important to suddenly, when you, it's the instantaneous bit of the sugar that, you know, on your phone, you can actually see things going up when you thought something was healthy, you know. So I, I, Changed while for a while to eating porridge for breakfast, oat, oat, and there was this huge myth that oats were amazingly good for cholesterol and uh, your heart, and particularly in the US, is massive campaign. And you have all these varieties. I tried about four or five different uh, oats, and I thought felt really being healthy, but then I saw my my sugar levels were really high wow. um, until I got to. Uh, the steel cut stuff that you had to sort of boil overnight and uh, was really thick, uh, you know hard to digest and then that was the only one that sort of worked and you see these real life experiments for yourself and then i gave one a monitor to my wife and we're having the same meal and you see her quite happily uh tucking into bread and toast with no sugar rises at all and me you know all over the place so yeah. that those sort of little insights will stay with you forever yeah much more than reading an article uh in a in a paper so i think this personalized thing is a real way to to elicit change, yeah, and and you won't go back after that. You know, I'll Which never, is, yeah. I'll never look at bread the same way, um, and I'll just wish I'd had you know eaten more pasta in the last twenty years than bread because that's much better for me. But you know, kind of things that aren't necessarily intuitive. Yeah, um, and did you say you can't get from the trial? And I know I remember reading that in the book about um, instant porridge oats versus steel cut oats. And again, it's sort of coming back to what you said before about. You know, grandma probably wasn't giving us instant porridge. <laughs> so she was probably, it was the real deal. Um, I mean, Tim, getting back to the book, because, you know, I could talk to you for hours about all kinds of different things. The, the book really has got a beautiful structure. You really, I think it, it's very actionable. You take on various myths and you walk us through the science, you know, a bit of storytelling there, sort of really with, with a practical take home from that, which I really like. Obviously, we're not going to go through all of them now, uh, given given how long we've already been chatting for. But uh, there's a few things. I think one of the the myths was that fish is always good for you, and I quite liked that chapter. Um, I wonder if you've got any insights on fish for people, because there is a there is a feeling out there, isn't there, that fish is like a wonder food. Uh, what, what, what's your opinion on fish? Well, I was a big fan of fish, uh, and I've been trying to force my son to. Eat eat fish all of his life and then give him fish capsules and uh, which I only found years later it, it stuck onto the bottom of the uh, in a drawer in the in the kitchen to rot uh, very carefully um, and it it turns out that a, a omega-3 fish oils don't pass muster when it comes to randomized trials so they don't so the fish oil extract which everyone thought was the important thing of fish doesn't uh, reduce heart disease um, which is a shock to many people. Um, and fish itself, you know, it's another meat. People forget that fish is meat. It's just uh, floating around in the water. Um, and it's been given magical properties uh, through maybe these blue zone areas and uh, the Japanese eating fish, although they ate lots of other things. But a lot of the people who were centenarians never ate any fish in Sardinia and Greece. They just ate masses of uh, goat and other things, uh, greasy other uh, animals. And the data 
really is pretty modest in terms of the, the benefits of fish. Uh, average trials show you know five to eight percent reduction in mortality, which, given observational studies, is is not significant. And increasingly, fish is farmed. So majority of the fish we eat in the world now comes from a farm, not swimming around naturally. And so it's full of chemicals, it's full of often pesticides, antibiotics, full of microplastics now. Yeah. Um, and if we did what we were told to, is all have two to three portions of fish a day, uh, fish would very quickly go extinct, or we'd be having to produce so much grain and soya to feed the fish farms uh, that they you know, would also run out of produce. So... Um, you know, I used to call myself pescatarian. Um, you know, I love fish, but it's massively overhyped. And I think we just need to stop the bullshit and, and realize that um, have it as a treat, get good quality stuff. But a lot of the fish we're eating now is either fake or very poor quality farm stuff that's ruining the environment. And so I think that's the, the sort of balancing message here. Yeah. And that the idea of these miracle foods is rubbish and it's just that's a really good example of a overhyped food that uh you know has no real basis um other than the fact we haven't found anything wrong with it at the moment apart from you know mercury and uh and eating lots of plastic I mean, what about people who would say that fatty fish like let's say it's not farm like wild salmon uh for example contains you know high levels of omega-3 which we know are helpful for brain development and function i mean what would you say to people who who would sort of um you know who would sort of pose that query i'd say absolutely go for high quality occasional high quality uh fish when you can have it um but don't reduce it to a few chemicals uh something like fish has hundreds of different chemicals in it uh, and vitamins and nutrients. But we can't just take one thing from it and say that's really important, that's why yeah. I'm having it. Um, yeah, in Scandinavia, it has vitamin D, so it helps some people with vitamin D deficiency through the, through the winter. But it doesn't mean it's a miracle food. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we should you know, religiously bend over backwards like we have for every other spirulina or every other fad uh, that comes along that, you know, that's chia seeds or super berries or yeah. whatever it is. Um, it, it should be part of this whole balanced idea of food. And I'm, I'm obviously saying, yeah, do eat fish, but do it in a way that's environmentally uh, aware. Go for the high quality, not the cheap uh, fake stuff yeah. that's being produced in farms that's destroying a lot of the world. Uh, and don't believe all the hype. And that's just a, a really good example of, of um, how, you know, we've said that red meat is bad, fish is really good. And of course, it, the devil's in the detail. High quality bits of both in small amounts, uh, I believe are absolutely fine. It, it really strikes me that what you're advocating, using the very latest science, is actually... <laughs> A back to basics approach. It's kind of saying, eat food that's been around, that's kind of been around for a long time, that's kind of natural food, that's as close to nature as possible. Play around with it, figure out which ones work best for you, and then eat more of that. You know, I don't mean to reduce down all the the, the incredible work you're doing, but but actually, I think that's a really empowering message. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, with a caveat that I think I. What I believe in is diversity and range of foods. Yeah. So one of the reasons I don't like people saying fish is a wonder food is that some people have sort of fish twice a day and means they don't get many of the other stuff yeah. because they're like the people who like carnivore diets, you know, fill their plates with, with meat. Uh, there's no space for anything else. Or the obsessional uh, vegan who just has uh, three types of kale. Um, any anyone who, who who tries to reduce things down to a few superfoods is denying themselves the diversity of plants that is really at the core of what I think is good advice. That we need to be having a much bigger range of foods, uh, both for taste, texture, 
the planet, um, but also for our gut microbes, because there's this key formula, which I, I do talk about in the book, that you know, to get your maximum diversity of gut microbes, which is gives you the greatest health for your immune system and your brain and all the chemicals they can produce, you should be having around 30 species of plant a week. And so as long as you stick to that, that can be back to basics, but keep it diverse. Do not get, uh, you know, diverted down some narrow tunnel of propaganda or religious fanaticism about a particular range of foods or this is super this or super that or I'm only going for these B vitamins or I'm only doing this. This reductionist nonsense is the new technology is making mockery of that. You know, we're, we're incredibly complicated uh, chemical factories. Our, our microbes are chemical factories. You know, we've got 26, we've got 20,000 genes, 26,000 different chemicals in food. We, we're producing, you know, we have thousands of species producing. We'd have you know, thousands of genes. And it, all of these are interacting. And so all our knowledge so far has been so reductionist, picking one vitamin, one nutrient, one of this. And everyone thinks they're an expert because, oh, do you realize that, you know, how much phosphate is, it, is in a <laughs> carrot? And, you know. <laughs> And people often catching me out because I've got no clue about, you know, because I've got no interest in that because I'm interested in the fact that, you know, a carrot has 600 different chemicals. Yeah. And I, we don't know yet. Half of it. Even half probably it. more than half of it. We do yeah. know that if we just took one of them and put it into a vitamin, uh, made that in a factory in China and said, this is, you know, carrot vitamin, uh, I could make a lot of money on it. But it wouldn't be the same as eating carrots. Yeah. Now, I, I really do like so much of the approach, Tim, and it's, 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 what, it's I've got to be honest, it's, you talk about in food, it's one of my frustrations in medicine, actually, that I think we have become super, super reductionist in how we look at things, even to the point of this is a gut problem, this is a chest problem, this is a heart problem. And I get it, right? And I understand that there is merit in that. But actually, you sort of said something at the start of the conversation that a lot of your colleagues actually are, are stuck studying one area and you have almost this kind of super generalist approach where I've, one thing I've noticed is that you, you, you've pivoted quite a few times in your career with that sort of underlying theme of what you stand for. You know, you started with the twins and genetics, but you've you managed to pivot and apply those principles to lots of different areas, which I find really, really fascinating. Uh, you mentioned him, the carnivore diet there. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes on it because it is something that is taking off hugely. Where, where do you come down on it in the sense that, let's say an individual patient, let's say it was one of your patients who was struggling with pain and all kinds of symptoms, and they you know, found someone on Twitter who was advocating it, and they then go away and start doing it, and a lot of their pain and symptoms go away, which is seemingly what is happening. What would you say to them, based upon the research you've done, what you're seeing in your trials, what you know about the gut microbiome? Because for that individual, they're experiencing a benefit. So what should they do with that in view of what the research shows? Well, I think that should... Um, it's a tricky the, question, I know. No, it is, but it's a good question because, I mean, I, I have it as well. And a lot of people do come to me and say, listen, you know, I've read your book, but I, I put, you know, I do very well on this. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so shut up, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and I can't argue with that because, you know, th they know best what they feel like. Uh, all I say is that any diet that restricts you, um, I think is likely to cause long-term problems. So by people who've gone, you know, whether it's uh, high fat or uh, high meat, uh, means they are excluding other stuff. And some of that stuff they might have got rid of might have been very bad for them. You know, lots of starchy carbs and things like this that didn't agree with them. All I would say is uh, long term, if you deprive your, your gut of fiber, all the studies show, and, you know, one of the experiments was on my son who uh, 
took McDonald's only for 10 days and took three years to recover. Um, you're, you're a proper scientist. Do you know what I mean? You can't, can't get the funding. Just put your son on, exactly. on the McDonald's diet. Everyone should use their children. I think that's the, that's the, that's the message here. Um, but no, so by all means, carry on doing what makes you feel good, but try and introduce some plants yeah. that aren't likely to mess up your blood sugar, that keep the, you know, if it is this 70% fat, that you know, the keto diet thing, I, I, you know, I absolutely do believe it works for some people. But I do think there has to be that short-term balance of uh, improving those symptoms with a long-term one to say, well, you don't want to be messing up your gut microbes so you've got no immunity later on. Yeah. You know, once you've got you over your pain and your initial problem, you need to be uh, – and it, this can be just by eating lots of seeds. It can be eating a lot of herbs. You know, it can be eating nuts. You know, it doesn't have to be restrictive. So if people just keep in this mind that – Okay, I can do these things, but I must try and maintain diversity. Yeah. You know, what other ways can I feed my gut microbes? Then I'm very happy for people to do their own thing, yeah. and I, you know, I embrace it because I think, you know, a lot of these things are trial and error. Yeah. But don't don't let be dominated by someone else telling you what worked for them because they had their special book yeah. and they cured it that way. You know, everyone's got to just look at the science and say, okay, th I'll try this, but. Under, underlying it, I know long term, I need to look after all the organs in my body. And your microbiome is one of the most important organs in your body. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really sensible approach, one that, that, that I very much agree with. And, and, and I sort of, I feel also that it's not just food, actually. So let's say someone is crippled with pain and in symptoms, and that's how they go carnivore, and that pain gets uh, dramatically better. Well, also, there's a knock-on effect in terms of how they feel about themselves, their life, their stress levels. I've seen over and over again that persistently high stress levels can absolutely impact um, the way people feel after certain foods. You know, I've, I've I've seen patients who actually thought they were intolerant to a food, and actually, what it appeared is that they were intolerant to actually eating in a stressed-out state, like not switching off, and. I, I'd be interested as your research uh, continues whether there'll be any work done on actually, you know, stress levels whilst eating, how that impacts blood sugar response, how that impacts inflammation. Because I would, I would imagine it will have a response, but I don't have the data uh, to show. So, so do let me know if you if you study that at some point. Well, yes, it's adding the stressometer to the uh, to the recordings, but uh, we, you know, in a way, I think we are asking people about. Um, uh, general contentment, how they're feeling at the time, and they're as they're logging on their foods, yeah. and so we do get an idea of uh, their well-being at various times in the day. So, uh, as well as sleep and exercise and uh, fatigue and these levels, they're all interrelated. So, I think we are going to start asking uh, quantitative things about stress and, and see how that fits in. So, I think. But you do need big numbers to do that, and that's. Yeah. But we're now up to about we've done about three, four thousand people now, uh, in great detail, and hopefully with this commercial stage, we should be able to get to ten, hundred thousand people fairly quickly, and then we can answer these yeah. more subtle questions. Wow. Uh, uh, and you know, yeah, and so there's really no limit um, if you can keep getting enough people to do these tests yeah. to work out what's really going on and we're, realize how complex we all are. Yeah. Tim, look, I could go on for hours. There's so much I want to talk to you about that we've not done yet. Um, but I think we should close off this conversation. I think it's been a very different one to our first one, back on episode one, yeah. uh, you know, all, all the way back. Uh, I would love to encourage people to pick up your book, Spoon Fed, Why Almost Everything We've Been Told About Food Is Wrong. I think for anyone who's got even the remotest interest in this area, I think they'll find it super enjoyable to read, but also illuminating. Um, to sort of finish this off, Tim, I don't know if I used to ask this on episode one or not. I'll have to go back. I'm not sure I could bear to listen to myself on episode one. But one thing I tend to ask people at the end is I say, well, this podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our life. And in view of everything you've done with personalized nutrition in this book, but also in uh, the diet myth before that, I'd love you to think about some really practical tips that people can think about now at the end of our conversation 
they can think about applying them into their own life immediately to start improving the way that they feel. First thing is to realize that everyone's unique. Okay, so once you realize that, um, you can explain a lot of the way you, you interact with health and food and exercise and your environment. And you should be free to, to self-experiment. And I want everyone to get out there and realize the amazing amounts of good, interesting foods are out there and that I don't want people to read this book and get worried about uh, themselves and uh, the food environment and chemicals and whatever. It's really important that people remain fascinated about food and enjoy it because it's, it's incredibly powerful bonding human experience eating so i want people to experiment try some new dishes you've never tried before um, try going for a week without meat or if you uh, try uh, only eating vegetables or try skipping breakfast try doing things in a different way so exercising uh, after you've had your meal rather than before it um, try mixing everything up really and uh, the important thing to realize is that if you can um, start to think of everything you put into your body is important, um, not just for the pleasure it gives you immediately, your metabolic responses, but also uh, you're feeding your aquarium, if you like, or your, your tank of gut microbes, uh, and they can produce chemicals to make you feel happy and relaxed and try and find that, that right balance. And it can take all of your life to find that, but uh, if you can do it in a way that's fun and enjoyable, then uh, that's that's the most important thing. So people shouldn't be stressed out about this. They should really take it as, as a positive challenge to try and improve themselves by uh, understanding more about food and teaching everyone else about it. And I think we, we've all got so much to learn and it's such an exciting area at the moment that I really want everyone to be passionately involved and everyone to be a citizen scientist. Yeah, love it. And of course, you'd encourage people to aim for that sort of 30 plants a week as well, I'm pretty sure. 30 plants a week, diversity, uh, regular fermented foods, um, and you know, avoid ultra-processed foods whenever you, whenever you can. The occasional binge is fine, but uh, just make sure it's not regular. And, um, and if you eat real good foods, you shouldn't need vitamins or, or supplements. That's the other really important message. Uh, and you know, as you're, and just uh, you know, realize that whatever you do, it's going to be unique, uh, but just make it fun. Yeah. Tim, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you for making the journey here. And I look forward to round three at some point in the future. Been my pleasure. Press subscribe to get more inspiration and ideas on how to feel better so you can get more out of life. And if you have a moment, why not check out this conversation that I've picked out as a perfect follow-up. Remember, lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you live more.